not many people know, um, you also ran a hedge fund. If you were investing in the market right now, what would your thesis be and what would your strategy be right now in the market to not only get great gains, but also mitigate risk? Yeah, my, my thesis right now is I'm only investing in companies that are great at artificial intelligence, period, end of story. So if you look at the biggest market cap companies, start at the top, you know, Apple, Amazon, um, Google, um, Netflix is further down, but any of them, right, that are up there, the one thing they all have in common is they are great at artificial intelligence. And that's important because AI is hard. Yeah. It's expensive and it's hard and it takes years to get right. And so you look at these companies, Facebook or whoever, and you say, how the hell do they keep on growing and how the hell do they keep on making money? Because it doesn't seem intuitive at some level, right? But then when you think about artificial intelligence, you start realizing AI isn't about creating new products. It's about tweaking all the things underneath you know, the water that makes you more profitable and more efficient. How do you price things? You know, Amazon and Walmart and these big companies use AI to pick the exact right price for you, right? Look at Netflix, right? It's crazy. Like if I look at Netflix um, for my son's um, account and he's 11, the pictures for the same movie are different, mm -hmm. right? Because they figured out he's a kid and they figured out they're better to put pictures of sports figures or attractive women or whatever for my account, you know, because I'm more likely to, to click on it. And so that type of thing for artificial intelligence, it's not necessarily obvious, but it makes all the difference in the world. And a lot of people, particularly if you, you know, if you're an entrepreneur or you invest in smaller companies, a lot of people talk about AI. 99.99% of it is BS yeah. because when they talk about it, they don't really understand it or know what's going on. And so that's my investment thesis, you know, Maybe there's an exception every now and then, like I own some Las Vegas um, Sands Corporation because I think the snapback in Vegas, you know, as, as we get back to normal is going to be unreal. You think it'll take what, five or six years? With that? You think it'll take what, five or six years? No, five or six months. People are going to be, you, know, <laughs> <laughs> think about it, man. you get your vaccination, you get your second vaccination, you do your two weeks before all of it kicks in, all the protection kit kicks in. What's the first thing you're doing? You're going to Vegas to get totally <laughs> more bottles. Good point. Yeah, yeah, bottle Good point. for you know, everybody. And, you know, so that's why I bought that stock. But, and even then they're really good with technology and figuring all this stuff out. But, um, yeah, so that, that's my thesis. I, I also um, bought the Russell 2000 index, the IWM, but I bought that a long time ago um, yeah. simply because I knew that at some point, you know, the money would get there. Um, but other than that, it's just, you know, Netflix and Amazon are basically my, my core holdings. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I was just going to say, you believe in the AI, which is why Amazon, Netflix is your largest holdings. Exactly. Um, but I, I, I want to talk about something that you have a, a, a great knowledge about, and that's the early internet. Yep. And recently you, you compared blockchain to the early internet. So yeah. I want to talk about that a little bit. Are, are you saying, obviously there's a lot of coins and there was a lot of dot coms and a lot of websites. Some will fizzle out and some will rise to the top. I want to know your thoughts in, in that comparison. Sure. So in the early days of the internet, like back in late 94, early 95, we're sitting around with my buddy who went to Indiana and we're like, mm -hmm. we got to use this internet thing to be able to listen to Indiana basketball. Because back then, back in the day, in order for us to listen to IU um, basketball in Dallas, I had to get somebody in Bloomington to put a radio next to a speakerphone. And then we would put the speakerphone on our desk in Dallas, have a six pack or 12 pack or case of beer and sit there and listen to the Hoosiers. Right. And, you know, that was the way we did it. Now, all of a sudden, the Internet comes along and you start realizing that having everything connected allowed us to change how things were done. Right. So back then, when I started talking about Internet broadcasting and say, look, we're going to be able to listen to basketball from anywhere in the world to anywhere in the world or any sporting event, any TV, any radio, any music, anywhere in the world. And people would say, well, dude, just turn on the TV, you know, just turn on the radio. Why are you doing all this stuff? And back then it was hard because you had to download all this software and have a modem just to get just to be able to listen to streaming. And I was like, no, you don't understand. It's just going to get easier and easier and easier and easier. And it's going to get to the point where everybody's using this and there's going to be a zillion other applications, whether it's eBay, whether it's Amazon, whether it's Google search engines, whatever. 
And so here we are, fast forward 25 years, 26 years, and the blockchain, right? Blockchain has been around for more than 10 years, <clears throat> but what, what really changed came along with Ethereum in particular. And with Ethereum, you've got smart contracts. Mm -hmm. And with smart contracts, you can start creating all these new types of applications. You have distributed finance, which is incredible, right? Excuse me, you've got non-fungible tokens and the ability to sell digital collectibles, which is incredible. And now there's competitive blockchains that are popping up and new applications, but the blockchain and the smart contracts and the ability to code at different layers on top of them are creating all these new applications. And so, you know, like baseball cards, trading cards versus digital collectibles, right? Like NBA Top Shots or other things, right? Used to be, wait, where's my, my John Brisker card? I grew up in Pittsburgh. John Brisker played for the Pittsburgh Condors. <laughs> In the ABA, I love this card. Mwah. But at the same time, I got to deal with making sure I don't screw up the corners. I got to make sure I keep it in good shape. If I want to sell it, I don't really know what the, how to grade it. I don't know what the price is. There's no real you know, fluid marketplace. And then once I agree, I got to package it and ship it and send it and hope they get it, right? But the, right now, it's not like I show this to everybody, even though I'm, I'm proud of it. But you know, it's really just pride of ownership. Yeah digital collectibles and it's not even the picture right you can get this picture of john brisker and nobody even knows who the hell he is but i love him <laughs> you know it's, it's, you can get this picture of john brisker anywhere on the net digital collectibles you got that same sense of ownership but when it comes time to sell right or to buy there's a marketplace where you know the price you click one button and you own it immediately you just pay however much is paid and you don't have to worry about shipping in or anything just bam you own it and that for particularly for Gen Z, you know, for Gen Z, your most the most valuable things you own after a house, a car, and maybe the, your clothes and shoes are digital, right? I mean, everything that's important is digital, and it's on your phone, and you're used to buying stuff. And so this whole market for NFT digital collectibles is, I think, going to explode, and it's starting to explode right now. And to me, the digital version to collect is more efficient and better and a better place to invest in than the physical version because you don't have all the hassles. Is cybersecurity going to be even more important as a result? My is always important, right? Because if somebody's good enough to hack, they're going to hack everything that they can, right? So when I was talking to a guy who runs a big company who said the same thing. He's like, well, my friends don't buy Bitcoin because they're afraid it's going to get hacked. Let me just tell you something. If you're capable of hacking Bitcoin, which hasn't been hacked in all these years, you're not going after Bitcoin, which has a $900 billion market cap. You're going to JP Morgan, which has trillions of dollars of assets, right? And it's, hard, it's, it's harder to hack Bitcoin because it's distributed than it is to hack JP Morgan because you know where they keep the money, right? Or the U.S. government and everything that the Federal Reserve is doing because, hey, you know, if you can't hack the government, it's going to be, you know, who knows how good they are at that? Yeah. And so I'm not worried about Bitcoin getting hacked at all because it's decentralized, it's distributed, as opposed to big, big, big banks, which are the exact opposite. My graduates from my school being Forbes, backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs> a mic drop. Backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs>